Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Dr. Jamie Turndorf. For expert advice on love and relationships, you can submit your questions online at askdrlove.com or post comments and questions to Dr. Love while you're watching live over Google Hangouts or YouTube. Now, here's Dr. Love. Welcome to Ask Dr. Love. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndor, and it is my pleasure to be with you today for Perfect Passion After 50. So let me ask you, have you noticed if your sex life is dwindling as you age? Well, I don't want you to despair, because today we're going to be talking with Dr. Lori Batito. She's the author of The Sex Bible for People Over 50. She's a clinical psychologist with a specialty in sex therapy, and she's been practicing as a psychotherapist for the past 26 years. She's also the president of the Sexual Health Network of Quebec, formerly Planned Parenthood, and the past president of the Canadian Sex Research Forum. And for the past 24 years, she's been dispensing sex and relationship advice over radio and TV, and she's also a regular contributor to various magazines and newspapers and TV shows. And you can also hear her nightly in Montreal on CJAD 800, and her show Passion has been on the air for 15 years, and it has always been number one in its time slot. So welcome, Dr. Lori. You're with me? (laughs) Thank you. Boy, do you say Montreal very sexily. Well, you know, I can't, you know, the thing is, I realized as I said it, because it's, I heard my husband, who was French, say Montréal, so I couldn't help but go into the French way. And then I realized after I said it, nobody will know what I'm talking about. It's, I have to say it the, um, the English way, Montreal. That's yeah. how we say or it, right? Montreal, as we say it. <laughs> say Montreal, like Munchausen. Exactly. And then I, when, when I did your call letter, C G, I started to say the J in like French. I do in French, C G, right. you know, and it's C J. It's, it's in English radio, in fact. Yes, I just yes. slipped. I just completely <laughs> slipped. So I'm so excited to talk with you because I know we're going to have an uplifting show, and I do mean this literally. <laughs> <laughs> How to keep flags flying at full mast, right? Uh huh. All righty. So, so talk to me. Why did you write this book for people over fifty? Well, I had a couple of reasons. One reason was rather selfish, turning 50 and having a partner who was over 50. So I decided, you know what, it's time for me to start looking at sexuality later on in life. And I started to be asked to give a lot of talks in Montreal and and elsewhere on aging and sexuality. So what I found was that there was a lot of information lacking. Like people need this information. And when I when I think of my listener base who are on average about 45 years old and mm-hmm. many of wh- whom are much older, they just they drink it all in because they there's a thirst for that knowledge that they they don't know where to really where to get it from. They're not exposed like the young younger people are and not that they don't have the internet and such, but there's still there was a missing piece for me and for many people, at least I found that from from my clinical practice, that people needed that sex education for older adults. That is so true. And you know the thing is probably a lot of people in this age bracket are a little less comfortable getting their advice on the internet because you and I both we grew up before the internet that's right you know that's right and they don't trust it and they don't know are they getting porn sites are they going to get you know so they and they don't know who to ask the question to often these are things they don't have they don't know quite how to put the question and of course the one thing I hear most often is people coming in saying look I'm feeling this way or that way is that normal when I oh, start you get to hear, that. oh, get that all the time. Is that a normal? Lot. Am I normal, right? Exactly. So, no, you're crazy. You know, you're just crazy. You're not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I really wanted a book that would say to people, listen, there's a variety of ways of being sexual, and there are. you have to expect changes as you get older. And just because you're not the same that you were when you were 20 or 30, just because your erections aren't as hard, just because you know, whatever, it doesn't mean you're not normal. It's it's part of the process, and we have to adapt to that process rather than lament the loss of something. It is a difference. It isn't a loss, but a difference. 
Yeah, and what you're saying, you know, so many women say that they're male lovers, if they're in heterosexual relationships, their male lovers have actually become better lovers as they've aged because they take longer to get an erection, longer to ejaculate. They're not mm-hmm. so quick, you know, on the draw. You know? That's right, and they're and more makes, willing. They're more yeah. willing to, to take the time to pleasure you, and they know your body better as well. But it's not just them, right? You're also, as you get older, as, we, as women get older, we get more comfortable in our skin. We may not like our body so much, but we still feel better in our skin overall and are yes. able to ask for what we want. We so, hope so, right? Well, you know? we try to be. That's, what we're, that's the aim, right? That's the goal. You know, when you said comfortable in our skin, I immediately riffed out on foreskin, and then I went off on this. I'm crazy, Laura, you know. I went off on this association where after my husband died, everybody says to me, you know, Jamie, you've got to do Internet dating. You live on a dirt road. Where are you going to meet anybody? So so I did a brief stint, you know, with Internet dating, and I – you know, I was talking on the phone one time with this guy, and he starts to get drunk, and he says to me, uh, you know, I have a feeling you have a wild side. This is what he tells me. And he says he wants to meet me midway. He lives somewhere, I guess, four hours away. And he wants to meet me halfway because I need to have some – no, I I back up. I have to say the first thing the guy said to me was, I saw your picture and I thought – I could F you. This is literally oh, what he nice. said to me. Really I'm nice. The, like, <laughs> Army, I'm thinking, my hero, Mr. Romance, you know. <laughs> He's just like my romantic French husband, right? So, And then he says to me, you know, I want you to meet me halfway because you need to have some skin in the game. And this is where my brain went, where I said, I think you mean you want some foreskin in the game. You know, this yeah. is where yeah. my brain went. Yeah. Like, no, thank yeah. you. Horrible. So that was a crazy association, but now I'm coming back now to (laughs) what we were talking about, about knowing your body as you get older, right? Mm -hmm. And I even read, I'm sure you saw the same research, right, that women who come out of marriages, you know, maybe in their 40s or 50s, Mm -hmm. end up being more orgasmic. People would think, oh, how is that possible that they're much freer, you know, Mm -hmm. and relaxed. that's one of those myths, Jamie, that, that women, as we get older, our, our orgasms are less intense when, in fact, the opposite is often true. They're better. They're more intense as we right? get older, again, because you know your body more and you're freer with yourself. So you're out of your head and into your body a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And then also, too, the women, the women that they surveyed were just so glad to be out of a, a relationship that wasn't working. Uh-huh. And so they were, they were even comfortable in having more casual sexual encounters. And yeah. they felt free, unfettered, and this was ma- much easier for them to have pleasure. Yeah. That's it. That's, you're absolutely right. They, uh, the, I hear it described a lot like, oh, I felt like I was back in high school again. Damn, you know, the, the, thing, right? which is great, which is why it's so important when we think about sexual desire, you know, these same women in those marriages that ended probably felt that they had that their desire had up and left forever. And then right. they, they, they divorce, they start to get involved in new relationships and they realize it was never gone. You know, it just needed to be woken up by the right context. And that's, That's the it. reality is that women in long term relationships lose that they lose that, that horniness, you know, they lose that, that spontaneous desire for sex with somebody you know for eons. But when you if you were to put them with a new partner, that mm-hmm. comes back. Now that's not I'm not saying that's the solution, but it just it just goes to show that it's dormant and not dead. Yeah, and the thing is, I mean, this is where, you know, my whole thing with resolve your conflicts, because you have unresolved conflicts, that's the number one killer of your love and your passion. It's a oh, major yes. later, as you know. Well, the, so, the, I mean, the if you're feeling as dry as the Sahara Desert, well, let's get you connecting. Let's you, have you feel understood and heard and getting along. And Boy, doesn't the uh, don't the juices flow? Doesn't the drive increase? You know? Right, and it isn't even the drive so much in terms of biology, because the drive to me is is a biological drive which women tend to lose along the way. Men 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 hang on to that for longer, but the women lose that. But what we need to focus on is a woman's motivation for sex. So you have to look at right. The well, that's what I'm calling yeah. drive. 
as if you don't feel connected, you don't have a drive to have sex. Right. You know, you have no motivated to do it. Yeah, motivated. We're using yeah, we're using a different word for the same thing because that is so true that if you don't feel connected and you don't feel safe, the first thing that goes off is your desire. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it's uh, it's amazing how stress and resentment and like all these things affect they do affect women generally speaking differently you know women women are much more detailed focused they're more in their heads and men are much better and we can learn something from them is that yeah. they're much better at separating what goes on in their body and what goes on in their brain yeah that compartmentalizing is yeah. so it serves them really well yes, you know uh like the classic the classic joke I tell in Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, where the, the two guys are asking each other, have you ever been too sick to have sex? And the one guy says to his other male friend, well, yeah, once I was too sick. sick." And the other guy says to him, man, I could have a 106 degree fever and I wouldn't be too sick for sex. And his friend responds, I said sick. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, that's it. That's exactly it. Whereas a woman you know, makes her sick to think that there's her kitchen is upside down, you know. Really, you don't take the garbage out? No, you're not getting below the, you know, <laughs> below the belt here, no. Well, you know, and it makes us seem so complex and guys are like scratching their heads, you know, like why? It's so unfair. It's so unfair. But it's not a question yeah. of fairness. It is what it is. It's, we're so different you know, the procreative imperative, the poor guys, they have 400 million sperm saying, come on, I don't care if we're not getting along. I got to spread my seed. I got to continue the species here. That's right. Know? Exactly. And the women are thinking, I don't want to get knocked up with a guy who isn't going to stick around, you right. know, and it doesn't feel safe. And, you know, women will say, but I'm past menopause. He can't knock me up anymore. But, our, you know, our psychological, biological programming doesn't care about that. You know? That's right. That's right. You know, it's, it's so crazy. So, you know, the, so the book really came out of your, if I may say, it came out of your own wish to really have the second half of your life be sexy and great. Absolutely, and it's just, and also, I'm surrounded by other fifty-year-olds, right? So, my my um, my everyday life in terms of my friendship circle, and you know, I have a large like web of friends, and they're all in their fifties. So, these are all the things we talk about. So, really, I wrote it for them. I wrote it for for us. I wrote it for my clients who also struggle with a lot of these questions. So, to and the listeners, my listeners who also, you know, I get thousands upon thousands of emails. And so I, I could I see what the what the patterns are, and so much to do with aging, so much to do with mm-hmm. aging. Mm-hmm. And aging you know, begins also, young. I wanted to also talk a little bit about some of the things that kill our sex drive, because you know we're going to take a little break. You know, my second segment I call Doctor Love's Quickie segment. You can okay. guess why. <laughs> it's I love short. it. <laughs> How fitting for our topic. But then when we come back, I always do some tweets on the topic just to sort of drive home the points that we're talking about. Okay. I'll do a few tweets, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the misconceptions because there are, I was going to do like the top five misconceptions that people have about sex over 50, sure. which you could just ditch these misconceptions. It would help a lot. And then some of the things that people don't realize that kill the sex drive, even though uh, they're unrelated to age, so that people will actually think, oh, it's because I'm older, when in fact it's not because you're older, it's something else that's causing it. So I wanted to get into that, and maybe we can slip all that in during the quickie segment. I don't know. It depends. If we can't be quick enough, we'll just let it run over to the next segment. Sure. My pleasure. All righty. We'll take a brief break, and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Dr. Loves Quickies. Wondering how to tell the difference between love and lust? Poor Mark. Every time he takes a woman to bed, he ends up scratching his head. His big head, I mean. How can he tell if he's in love or only in lust? Time. Lust usually fades in a few weeks while true love lasts. So when it comes to gauging if you're in love or only in lust, remember you can't trust lust. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf of AskDrLove.com. 
You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Ask Dr. Love is the web's premier relationship advice site since 1996. Visit AskDrLove.com to search thousands of free relationship advice articles on any relationship issue you may have or submit a question to her free advice column. You can also watch this broadcast live over Google Hangouts or YouTube. Sign up for her newsletter at AskDrLove.com to be the first to know about her upcoming radio shows. And find out how you can watch her live and ask her questions in real time. Don't be shy. Dr. Turndorf wants to help you. So take advantage of this unique opportunity to get a personal answer from one of today's most respected experts. This show is for you, the listeners. So if you have a question for her, make sure to watch live on Tuesdays from 1 to 2 Eastern Time on Google Hangouts or YouTube. Or catch the archived broadcast on webtalkradio.net. Now, back to Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking about perfect passion after 50 with my guest, Dr. Lori Batito, author of The Sex Bible for People Over 50, and this is Dr. Love's Quickie segment. So, Lori, I was saying to you before we took the break Mm -hmm. that I was interested in debunking some of the myths that people have about sex over 50. 50. So do you want to sure. lay a few on us now? I shall. The first yeah. one the first one is that sexually women peak in their 30s. We always say that women achieve their their peak when in fact um, both men and women really peak at the same age, which is 18. When we talk about a peak, we're talking about a a, a testosterone or a um you know, a, a hormone Peak, but that doesn't that changes after where um, that all levels drop for both men and women. They just happen to drop faster uh, for women. But it, that doesn't mean that women can't have the best sex of their lives later on. So when we hear that that women peak later, actually we we often hear in their 40s and in their 50s that they peak uh, because it's only in later life that they. No, like we said before, they know their bodies more, they're enjoying themselves more, they're not worried about getting pregnant. Uh, and all the studies, like the many, many studies and surveys have actually shown that. So it, it, it's out there. This is, But yet we think, you know, uh, mm-hmm. that it's only in their 30s, when in fact it's probably closer to their 50s, that women. Mm-hmm. Another, oh, one is another, that, one? another one is that the orgasms you have when you're young are better, are more intense. So meaning that sex is probably more satisfying when you're young. And again, that's not true. Many studies are showing that women are more orgasmic as they age and are more likely to have their even their first orgasms later, for the very first time, much later. So again, mature women have a better understanding of what makes them tick, right? And they're much less afraid of asking for what they want, which means that if they can ask for what they want to be touched in the way that they want, then they can be... Uh, you know, stimulated to have that orgasm much better, much faster than if they said nothing and didn't show. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another well, myth is that erection problems are inevitable, which is untrue because, first of all, all men experience some erectile dysfunction at some point in their lives, and only about a quarter of those men later in life experience uh, erectile dysfunction severe enough to require medication, whereas we think, oh, all men after a certain age need Viagra, for example, which isn't true. Mm -hmm. Another myth is that we lose interest in sex as we get older, and we talked about desire. We, We may lose some of the spontaneous desire for sex or that feeling of, I need, I need, I need. It's no longer a need but you're still very motivated for sex. You still have, your interest is there. Your spontaneous desire may not be there, but your interest in sex is absolutely there. It is alive and well and usually stays there. So um, that, you know, that's a, certainly one of the, the big myths. And another one is that the quality of sex decline, uh, declines as we age. And again, studies have shown that the quality actually improves. You know, it's that quantity over quantity, uh, quality over quantity thing. So all the studies that I looked at uh, really showed that it doesn't uh, decline with age, that the quality, people can actually be much more satisfied with their sex lives as they age. 
That's nice. Very, very reassuring. Yeah. But let me, I have a couple more that, you know, when we come back, I'll say a couple more that I was thinking of, see what you think of them. Sure. And I love that, you know, because we didn't prepare what we were going to talk about. We just kind of went on the sperm of the moment. <laughs> ah. Yes, the sperm <laughs> of the moment. <laughs> Remember Archie Bunker used to say that? What a kick in the groan and on the sperm of the moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll lay a few on you when we come back, but let me just give you a couple tweets before we take a break. And here's one that confirms what you're saying. Sex over 50 can still be nifty. <laughs> and our sexual thermometer is actually a health barometer. Uh-huh. So I want to talk about that, too, because a lot of times when you think, oh, I'm just old, no, it's a sign something's not working right health-wise. And I want right. to talk about that more when we come back. And for many women, what's in your pants is less important than the romance. (laughs) (laughs) Very true. Uh, So let's just take a brief break, and I'm going to be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. If you yearn to get along better with your life partner or spouse, friends, family members, and even co-workers, Dr. Love's latest Hay House book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, Dr. Love's 10 Simple Steps to Cooling Conflict and Rekindling Your Relationship, shows you how to turn conflict into connection for a lifetime of lasting love. Find out more about this book and even read a free excerpt by visiting AskDrLove.com. This is Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. And if you have a question for her, make sure to watch live over Google Hangouts or YouTube, where you can submit your comments or questions and connect with Dr. Love in real time. Or listen to the archived show at webtalkradio.net. This show is for you, the listeners, and Dr. Love wants to hear from you. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, talking with Dr. Lori Batito about perfect passion after 50. And before we took the break, I wanted to talk about some of the other myths. And here are a couple that I was thinking of. What do you think about this one? Mm -hmm. This one, I think, comes from, uh, often women think this one, if you're having sex with someone, it must be a serious relationship. Right. Right. Yeah. And especially, you know, because of the generation that we came from, lots of times, well, the women thought, well, we weren't having sex unless it was love and marriage and babies, you know, and mm. can't that's changing. That. Yeah, that, that, that's changing as we're seeing so many more uh, baby boomers involved in the online dating and, and even Tinder and things like that. So yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that's changing a bit, right? And I even, you know, but I even see it with young women. You know, they think, well, I'm going to use my uh, mm-hmm. my sexuality as a hook, you know, to hook the person in. And if we're having sex, he must love me. And you'll see people making that mistake, you right. know, well, young handles. Well, part of the problem, too, is that when women have sex, they, you know, that oxytocin is, is released, right? So the oh, bonding yeah. hormone. So they feel much more bonded than the guys do. We have much more of that hormone so they can misinterpret that or get hurt more easily because they get more attached once they have sex. Very, very true. And it's so true, the oxytocin or the, what they call the cuddle hormone. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's so much better for women because, you know, you can't fight your biology and you do bond. It's best to be more comfortable about the relationship, you know, and be clear that you're both on the same page before you jump into the sack, you know, because right. you can get hurt. Yeah, so unless you're on both on the same page and you just want to have like, you know, friends with benefits, mm. and, and even you're still going to get even it. that has a risk because it, and you're it still going to get attached. Yeah, exactly. You will get attached, and you know it's just natural. You know, people say, well, men don't get attached, but even you know when you read the studies, men who go to prostitutes they get attached too. <laughs> they you know, it's naturally bonding experience. So. And you know what? Older men tend to want more bonding. That's what yeah. I've noticed, is that the, old, the older guys want the intimacy, not so much the sex. I mean, they want yes, the sex, but that, that's less important. Right? As yeah. the testosterone diminishes, they become much more like the way we've always wanted them that's to be, right. more about intimacy. Yes. That's exactly. And here's another one I always like to think about. You know, a lot of times people think, oh, I'm too old to worry about STDs. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> That's a biggie, right? <laughs> oh, I have to tell you that I do talks in nursing home, in residences, you know, seniors' residences, where the average age is like 82. And I, yeah. always, I always go there with a big bowl of condoms 
and my condom demonstrator and my slides and I show them how to put it on. And why yeah. is that? Because the statistics are showing that the greatest rise, in, in the greatest increase in STIs is in the elderly population. And mm-hmm. in talking with them, I started to see, you know, first of all, men, uh, women far outnumber the men in these seniors' residences. So what you have is you have two or three guys going from room to room. Like they have Can multiple you ima- partners. I mean- the guy's wet dream, he's now like servicing this harem of women. <laughs> At 85 years old. It's like, he's, damn, he's I'm in getting heaven. <laughs> I, it's like, oh, my God. And I'm giving them all herpes, you know? Yeah, oh, great. my God. I'm telling yeah, people now, it's like, if you really want to get a lot of action when you're older, move into a senior's residence. Damn, I'll, I'll take that under advisement, right? <laughs> get the internet dating, right? <laughs> uh, that's fun. Try it. But, right. it, but, you're, but you're absolutely right. With they, and, you know, that's a generation, truly a generation, that did not use condoms or use condoms only when but prior to marriage, right? The, that's the, right. They, they didn't even call them condoms. They were French letters or I don't know what else they were calling them. Oh, the French ticklers? Was that the, what that was? No. <laughs> the French, you know, the, 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 the French letter in the war, that's what they were calling them. Yeah. And, anyway, and they were only right. using them for when they knew they were having sex with prostitutes or and it, it has to do with pregnancy too, right? Pregnancy prevention. So they're not right. worried about getting their 85-year-old lover pregnant. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, keep it in your pants if you're not going to use condoms. And, <laughs> you know, but this is, a, you know, this is a whole other touchy subject is, you know, people don't even know about the dental dams. You know, it's like oh, you can get sex, STDs yeah. by doing oral sex on a woman, right, yeah. without using a dental dam. So, but how many people are willing to buy a dental dam or cut a condom open and make it into a dental dam and go down on someone, you know, through the latex? Right. Well, try convincing a woman to give a guy uh, oral sex with the condom or try convincing the guy that he should wear the condom during oral oh, sex. Oh, it ain't happening. It's not it happening happen- enough, and, but it should, but it isn't. Yeah. Oh, I know. And then the worst thing is, you know, I, I went to give a talk, and the person who was speaking before me was a gynecologist, and she was talking about STDs. And when she got to the part about pharyngeal herpes, you know, where yes, you give oral sex to uh-huh. a guy or, you know, a woman and you get it down your throat and then you end up in the hospital because you're, you know, riddled. I said, that's it, man. I, I, I got to turn into Mother Teresa. I heard that I one. I know, it's scary. Well, the, there's a, they have never seen as much throat cancer as, as they're seeing now. Just right. through, through HPV infections and, and the chlamydia and gonorrhea and, all, you know, these viruses also live in the back of your throat and they can cause like some serious damage. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what I think happened to Michael Douglas, you know? That's what he said anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, who the <laughs> hell knows? I wasn't there. <laughs> I didn't do a culture after he went down. That's right. Someone. It, wasn't yeah, my, yeah. it wasn't my vagina, so... <laughs> I'm pleading the fifth. No. Exactly. So, uh, so, and here's a good one. Um, many people over 50 think they already know what they like sexually and that they should just stick to the routine, but then they actually, with this stick-in-the-mud attitude, stick it to themselves in the sex department because yeah. their bodies are changing, you know? Yes, and Always they have changing. to adapt. They have to, they, they really ah. need to adapt. When you think about some of the changes that happen, for example, uh, a man, to have... To get the same erection he once had, you need a lot more time and a lot more direct stimulation in order to get there. So doing the same old, same old to, to, and, and getting upset that it's not getting there, you have to change the way you do things. Women, too, right. need more direct stimulation. So you, ha- you're going to, you, can, you have to alter your positions to get that or you have to use toys or you have to start mm-hmm. introducing new things so that your body continues to respond. You know where macho women buy their vibrators? Where? Black and Decker. (laughs) (laughs) I like that one. (laughs) You know, the thing is, so now we're going to that topic I wanted to speak about before during the quickie segment, the the health question. Because a lot Mm -hmm. of people think, oh, well, you know, I'm not getting uh, erections. Well, it's just because I'm aging. But ultimately, your penis is a barometer of how well the blood is circulating, right? That's right. Well, in fact, there was an interesting study that looked at people who had erectile dysfunction. It was a longitudinal study, and they found that erectile dysfunction was a precursor of 10 years 
for heart yep. disease. So yep. even 10 years earlier, that would mean that if you had erectile dysfunction and you didn't check on it, yep. the, the chances of you having heart disease later on were very high. So exactly. obviously, if you're, and when I, whenever I see a client with erectile dysfunction anywhere close to the age of 50, anywhere really after 40, I always say, please, you need to check your blood pressure, you need to check your heart, because mm-hmm. if the blood isn't flowing to your penis, it may be not flowing to other vital organs. It is. Um, it's got to be, because, you know, this. Uh, why would it only discriminate against your penis and say, exactly. we're going to clog only to this main artery? No, <laughs> you know? Right. That's right. So yeah, it's a barometer. Your your penis is your sexual thermometer. That's really your health barometer, right? So we want to be you want to be realizing that. And then you know, so that really it bothers me when I see people just going for drugs to treat That's the right. symptom or Viagra, Cialis, and you're just treating a symptom, and it's like a raging forest fire is going on. Yeah. You know, you've got clogging of the arteries and so on, and sure, and, then and you're all, ignoring it. You ignore it, yeah. and then eventually. Something happens, and you had the warning. The warning signal was there, and you ignored it. Your penis was the wake-up call, your lack of blood flow, and so on. Yeah. So, And then, of course, people don't realize also, well, here we go again. I mean, this is just my pet peeve about using drugs to suppress symptoms instead of getting at the underlying problem, like even blood pressure medications. Alternative MDs will tell you all the time that blood pressure is a symptom. You know, it's in itself not a problem it is a symptom of other underlying health problems or kidney toxicity mm-hmm. and so on and so on. But the blood pressure meds themselves cause a lot of yes, sexual erect- dysfunction right. and erectile dysfunction, right? Well, that's then the we- catch-22. Unfortunately, yeah. when you, if you lead an unhealthy lifestyle, you're going to develop a lot of things like potential you know, diabetes and high blood pressure and, and, and all the drugs that are given to um, you know, moderate that or to to make that more uh, you know, not to cure it, but to to control it, yeah, yeah. have an effect on your sexual functioning, whether it's or whether it's arousal or uh, right uh, excitement or orgasm or what have you. So it has an impact. So this is why maintaining a healthy lifestyle is so is obviously That's so it. important. Yeah, and even I'm sure you see that birth control pills themselves can affect. A woman's drive, you know, sometimes absolutely messing with hormones in this way makes her lose desire. Well, there's a, certainly a link between uh, sexual desire and birth control pill. Again, not all pills, well, and then not all women will have that that impact. Only about you know anywhere five ten percent of women will experience that. Right. But again, you have to you have to decide which one is good for you and which dose is good for you and. You mm-hmm. know that there are at least 200 medica- commonly prescribed medications that have a sexual side effect, but your doctor will never tell you about them. It's so true. Yeah. It is so true. And then people don't think also about just the effect of stress. Besides, we spoke before about unresolved relationship conflict. Mm-hmm. Terrible. Stress, money worries. These things produce, produce the chemicals that are incompatible with sexual arousal especially for women, not that stress doesn't affect men, because many men do, cannot function sexually because of stress, but then you have, on the other side, you have men who use sex to release the stress, right? They Mm -hmm. find that it's a relief from the stress. But Mm -hmm. generally speaking, stress can kill you, every part of you. It's not just your Mm -hmm. erections or your drive or anything, but we know that stress is related to a, a myriad of illnesses, it's just everything. It shortens your lifespan, you know. Well, specifically, unresolved relationship conflict definitely shortens the lifespan. Well, that's we know the biggest stressor. That that happens to be the biggest stressor because that is the biggest chunk of our lives is the relationships yeah. that we're in. And if that's stressful, very stressful, very conflictual, very chaotic, then yeah. you are making yourself sick. And, you know, it's so funny because that's what Kiss Your Fights Goodbye is all about. You know, my my method for resolving relationship conflict is, is just right there. But so often people are so married to their dis, their discord and their fighting That's true. that it becomes such a way of life, not realizing that it's really shortening your life oh, and affecting incredible. every aspect of your life, right. including your sexuality. And what, right? sometimes I see that in my office, and I don't know, I'm sure you get that same feeling as you want to shake somebody and say, you got to get out, you know, this is killing you. Look what you're doing to yourself. 
Yeah. And it's um, the thing it's, is, getting divorced doesn't fix it because you take your same dysfunctional strategies to your next relationship. Well, you so have to fix yourself. Fix your deal, you know, fix how right. you're dealing with your stuff, you That's know. That's right. And then yeah. you see, exactly, it's not a question of removing the partner in order to fix. You fix yourself in this relationship and then see what happens. Sometimes by fixing yourself, the entire relationship gets fixed, but other times it falls apart. Nonetheless, you still have to fix yourself. You you might as well do it because there's nowhere to go but up. And then you see because so often, you know, you're a pebble in the pond. Mm -hmm. You change, the whole surface of the pond changes, and the other person very often just automatically changes in response to you being different. And as you say, if the person doesn't, well, then you're at least bringing a new version of you to your next relationship. That's right. I like that. That, 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 that. I love that, the new version of you. I just had a patient say that. I don't want, you know, saying I don't want to be that version of who I was you know, four years ago, I want, I'm going to stick with this new version. And if oh, my husband can't take it. That word, isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting, huh? Yeah. It's sort of the collective unconscious. It really is. Yeah. And, of course, you know, another one people don't even think about, right, is just the sleep deprivation. How that? Oh, that's a big one. Kills your sex drive. People don't think of it. Dead from the neck down, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Well, you think about how many people in our society – suffer from sleep apnea. Oh, yeah. And, right? sleep, you know, that's a huge, like, people don't realize it, but also we live in a society of a lot, you know, there's, I don't know how many of us are overweight, but plenty enough. And that affects our sleep because that affects our apnea. You know, you're more likely to apnea if you are overweight. And many other things that we do with ourselves, like smoke and all, all the other bad habits that we have, that affect our sleep ultimately. And we don't realize that not having a good night's sleep regularly just, you know, doesn't just make us cranky and uh, it, it affects us physically. Mm-hmm. So. Absolutely makes you a not happy camper. That's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Well, it's really fun talking to you. You too. I'm, I'm loving this. <laughs> yeah, we're having a good time. If you were a boy, I'd date you. Ah, yeah, I love it. A... Two, the two radio people talking to each other. It's really fun. <laughs> I know. All right, let me just take a brief break, and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Dr. Love's Quickies. Mary's about ready to give love the shove, because no matter what she tries, guys don't know that she's alive. To turn guys on, she needs to turn on those green lights, nonverbal cues that say, over here. Most guys won't approach unless they're cleared for landing. So ladies, to kickstart your love life, turn on those green lights and flash your pearly whites. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf of Ask Dr. Love. You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To submit your questions to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, sign up for her free newsletter at AskDrLove.com and get the details on how you can connect with her on Google Hangouts or YouTube during her live broadcasts or listen to the archived show at WebTalkRadio.net. If you've recently been through a breakup and are looking for a second chance, wondering how you can reconcile with your ex or if it's even possible after all you've been through, Dr. Love's book, Make Up, Don't Break Up, presents her proven five-step plan for reconciling with your ex. This plan was developed over years of research, working with thousands of couples at her Center for Emotional Communication. This is a proven, no-hype, no-nonsense method that gets right to the root of the problem and shows you how to reignite the spark and rekindle your love. For more about Make Up, Don't Break Up, visit AskDrLove.com. And now, back to Dr. Love. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love Radio with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking about Perfect Passion After 50 with Dr. Lori Batito. So let's talk a little bit about why it's so important to maintain your sexuality into old age. Well, health-wise, it's a, it's so important. You know, I always use the use it or lose it kind of thing. You want to get the blood flowing, right? So keeping active gets the blood flowing, and we know that when you keep the blood flowing, your vagina uh, will produce more estrogen, your penis will get a workout, those, those um, veins will get a workout, so the arteries will work a little bit better. That helps. Of course, there's so many reasons why we should continue to have sex. All the studies point to benefits. There's only benefits to it. You live longer. You look seven years younger if you maintain an active sex life. It reduces stress. 
It uh, makes you happier. People who have regular sex lives are happier. It provides a great workout. I mean, okay, it's not like going to the gym necessarily, but it gives you some cardiovascular workout. So there's so many health benefits to it. Yeah, uh, where do you sign? It sounds good, right? Well, that's the thing. It's it it is good. It is good for you. I just, you know, it's unfortunate that so you know we talked a lot about the resentments and the relationship issues that those really get in the way of maintaining this healthy sexuality, which is so good for us, and then we end up kind of feeling. Uh, like it's a chore or obligation or guilt or shame and all these negative associations to sex and that's mm-hmm. the sad part you know really? we have to kind it of really, do away really with is. all that yeah uh, mhm so so what what about people who have health issues oh by the way we should say because people sometimes think oh only sex with a partner counts but no masturbation will sure. also do the same it's still yeah. going to get the blood flowing and all of that, right? Right, and now, you can. And there's lots of things available to help you in that department now, like toys. Like We're toys. talking about, you know, like the Black and Decker <laughs> macho right. women. <laughs> <laughs> lots so, of toys for women. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, what what do you tell people to do if they have health issues that are preventing them from having? Well, first of all, let's define sex, right? When when I right. you're saying sex, you're talking intercourse right now. When uh, you know the, my book describes sex, and like we talk about many many different aspects of sexuality. You don't need to have intercourse in order to have healthy sex. I know plenty of couples who do not have intercourse but have very active sex lives, right? Yep. So yep. there are, there are many ways to have sex, and we and this is what couples could explore so a lot of uh, all the touch anything to do with touch and sensuality and it doesn't always have to be genitally focused it doesn't always have to lead to an orgasm as we get older the need for orgasm becomes less and less and i hear that from men as well as women orgasms of course are wonderful and they're nice but they're not an absolute necessity and yeah yeah yeah, because sometimes they're harder to come by Absolutely, or there, or you can still feel great, and it's yeah. not even that they're harder to come. I mean, yes, they are as you get older, but you're still having a satisfactory encounter. Just because totally you don't right. have the and orgasm doesn't mean it's not satisfying to you. A lot of guys don't even realize that they can actually have an orgasm without an erection. That's right. I talk right? about that too. I talk about that, and they can before. even have intercourse without an erection. It, it has to be, you know, at least solid enough to get in there. But uh, some I had heard, you know, some time ago about a technique called stuffing. Stuffing. You familiar with that one? <laughs> I've heard it too. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, again, one. you can stuff it in and keep it there, and that can feel good too, you know. And and you have to be willing to explore. Don't give up. I've seen too many people say, "Oh well, my penis isn't working. I'm just going to give it up," you know, and and, yeah. and forget about it. And that that I find sad because they're giving up not just the intercourse. They give up everything else related to intimacy. You know, I had a guy, Michael Russer, on the show. The show was called Intimacy Without Intercourse. Mm-hmm. And he had undergone prostate surgery, which rendered him impotent. And he, right. he's not an old guy. And he describes his journey back to total intimacy and sensuality and sexuality. And the woman that he is with, his life partner, he actually tried with her. You know, he tried different techniques for inserting things in the urethra to try to get an erection and injections and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And finally he just said, look, this is it. I cannot have intercourse. And he he describes in great and beautiful detail how they have such amazing sex life with no intercourse. And she, when she began the relationship with him, was so dry, couldn't lubricate. And because they found such intimacy and physical connection, he said that you could bottle how lubricated she is now and how many orgasms she has and how many orgasms he has and they have so much pleasure together and yeah well if you think back you know think back when we were younger and doing other things besides intercourse remember when i mean back in those days you weren't having intercourse right away you were fooling around an awful lot and that that excitement of all that other stuff 
You know, yep. and and if you ask couples who have been together for a long time, ask them how often they make out. You're yeah, going, just, it's oh. shocking, shocking to hear that so many can't even remember the last time that they had an intimate deep kiss. Even I mean, during really? even during sex. During intercourse, it doesn't happen. And that, to me, is another really sad thing. And yeah. so, so sometimes intimate. when I see couples, I will tell them, I'm, uh, you're not even allowed to have intercourse. I'm taking that off the table. The next month, you are going to explore all the other ways that you can be sexual and all the other ways that your body can give you pleasure yeah. without sticking your penis in that, into that vagina. Yes. And, you know, it's so funny. I had a couple, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, he was getting performance anxiety because, mm-hmm. you know, this happens a lot. You get one yeah. failed attempt, then you start to worry. Now you're producing the, the stress chemicals that prevent you from getting subsequent erections. Right. So it literally made himself impotent. So right. to take his penis off the table, you know, I just said, you're not allowed to have sex at all. <laughs> you know, you're only allowed to just touch each other everywhere and kiss each other, but you are forbidden from having any right. kind of intercourse, right? So <laughs> just from taking it off the table, you know, so he wasn't worried about getting an erection. Of course, he gets an erection. Of course. So the two of them said, screw Jamie, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we work the same way, Jamie, because we, I've had the ex- uh, you know, same, same situation yeah. over and over again. There they were yelling at me, screw her, and then they said, we're not let screw her. That's so funny. Yeah, and they were cured all of a sudden, you see? Yeah, right, right, right. So I know you suggest that people should stretch their boundaries, so tell everybody what you mean by that. Well, stretching boundaries meaning, look, sometimes boredom does set in, right? You've been with somebody for many, many years, and, you know, it's been the same way, the same thing. There's so many other things you can do. And you can stretch your boundaries by starting talking about things that you might want to try, things that you might have thought of trying. Mm. And, you know, so, and sometimes we're talking like light bondage, for example. What if I was blindfolded? Mm. You know, what if um, I tied your hands up? Like getting a bit kinky mm-hmm. or do some of the fantasy and role-playing kind of stuff where mm-hmm. let's pretend... Um, you know, I had one couple that did this, which was kind of fun. They would go out, and she she would go off to the to a bar, and then he'd come in and uh-huh. he'd pretend he'd see her across the room, and he didn't know her. And you know, I think they got this from a movie somewhere. But anyway, and it re- really worked. Like they would play out this whole scenario and this whole seduction thing. And so, you, you just want to you kind of play with it a little. You know, you can play with it in the bedroom. So get so getting using fantasy, getting you know a little bit kinky, using props. Using sex toys, sex toys aren't just for masturbation. They can be used in the couple, too. Yeah. So, but it, some people, some guys get so defensive, like, oh, you need this, I'm not enough for you. So you oh, have to first, always, I'm sure you tell getting, them they have to yeah, talk about it first, make sure nobody's nose is right. getting out of joint, right? Exactly. You've got to have that yeah. conversation. Obviously, you're not going to stretch boundaries without dis- without having open conversations about sex. Right. That's ridiculous. Right, because right, you're not right. going to come in into the bedroom one day and say, let me blindfold, gag you, and tie you up, you know, and never have spoken about some of these yeah, really. things that, before. That, that's the boundary. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good. Yeah, that's not how you do it. And then, you know, then I talk also about other things that people can try that isn't for everybody, but I certainly know couples in their 50s who have gone that route, and that is to have open marriages. Mm-hmm. You know, they experiment with the boundaries of sexual permission, if you will, right? Yeah. I've always been very wary of that particular aspect because, you know, I, I know Gwyneth and her partner got into, was it Gwyneth or who, who was it who got into the open marriage thing? Oh, it was Demi, you know. Um, was she? Yes, and oh. it got so messed up because so often what happens in these cases, you know, it's like, well, now uh, you're more turned on by this one than by me, right. and then the right. jealousies. And so it's a real slippery slope. I'm always wary of that, you know? Right. And in, in fact, in my book, I, I, I talk a lot about this, that if you're going to go that route, you better have some very clear, uh, you better think very clearly about the factors that you need to consider. Because you, um, these, like you said, you know, how, you know, how will I feel if my partner seems to be enjoying his lover more than he enjoys me, for oh, example? My, my or what goodness. if that new partner has more stamina than me? What if that new partner has a bigger penis than me? Is it yeah, going to like, affect oh, me? What a can of worms. 
Exactly. Really? So exactly. This is, it's, you are treading, you have to go there very, very carefully, and you have to have a lot of rules. So in the book, I, I actually give out a whole bunch of rules that you need to be there so that you don't, you know, to minimize that risk, if you will. Yeah, and then the thing is, too, you don't know how you're going to feel until you feel, and then you can't bolt the barn door after the horse has fled. So I'm, I'm oh, always once it's kidding. done, Jamie, it's you cannot turn Turning back. back. Can I just tell you the story of one couple that I met? So he was after his, his wife <clears throat> to have a more open marriage. And for years and years, he kept saying, Come on, let's have a polyamorous relationship. Let's have an open relationship where you can have, you know, you can have other partners, I can have other partners. And she was always very resistant to it. And so finally she says, you know, okay, fine. This is what you want. Fine, we'll do it. She mm-hmm. is the first one to find another partner. He, yeah, uh-huh. of course, then gets, he goes nuts. He, the other, he freaked out. It was not good. And then yeah. she realized, hey, you know what? I kind of like this. I'm okay with this. Yeah, and yeah. now he can't turn back the clock. No, you cannot. You can't unring that bell. That's yeah. right. Right. So, so often, a lot of times, you know, actually, I've talked a lot about this recently, you know, all this, oh, polyamory is the solution for monogamy, no. which doesn't work. Well, guess what? No. If you figure out how to work your conflicts out, monogamy works just fine. Oh, so, yes, uh, you know, sidestepping mm-hmm. the problems, well, I'll just go and open the relationship. Well, that that doesn't no. solve it. You just take your problems into another relationship. First of all, so. one thing for certain, if you're going to have an open relationship, you cannot have issues in your relationship. You, uh, only the relationships that are very solid, very open in terms of their communication yes. can do this. You can, if this is not an answer to a pro- problematic relationship. Exactly. Yeah. So how do people know when they need, because we only have two minutes, and I want to make sure people know how to find you. So you know, you and I could talk probably for 10 days. Oh, yes. So probably you just have to come back. That's what we're going to do. Good. And, um, and then we'll just talk more. So let's just make sure, because I want everybody to know how to find you. Say the name of your book again. Let's do that. Sure. All right. So the book is, it's just out this week, in fact, in bookstores, uh, The Sex Bible for People Over 50, The Complete Guide to Sexual Love for Mature Couples. It's a quiver book, and it's available everywhere, and it's uh, in hardcover. I can be heard nightly on a radio station, uh, and you can listen to it online as well, cjad.com, and the show is called Passion, and it's on Eastern Time 10 p.m. 10 to 11 p.m. Monday uh, to Friday and my website is drlaurie.com that's d-r-l-a-u-r-i-e.com well I have to say this is our first meeting but I have an immediate passion for you <laughs> likewise Jamie likewise I can't wait I'm to have so... you on my show oh yeah so you'll email me after and then I'll uh, we'll hook up and we'll make that happen oh absolutely, absolutely. alrighty and, and yes. I just bad you don't live closer because I have a feeling you and I would be just hanging out all the time. I'm going to come visit you. Now that I know you're not so far away, I'm going to come visit you. Oh, how exciting. I'm thrilled. (laughs) All righty. So I'm not going to say goodbye. I'll say we'll talk soon, and I'll see you all next week on Ask Dr. Love Radio.